Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new video in which we're playing as everyone's favorite East African uh, Interim Unity Government and you know the East African Interim Unity Government. We're led by William Westmoreland so if you'd like to read about him please go right ahead but we gotta talk about the East African Government. The new government of East Africa, the East African Interim Unity Government or the EIUG is far from unified and far from a functional government. While on paper it should be made up of military representatives from all around the OFM, it's basically an American rule of military protectorate. As the administration, reluctantly led by the American General William Westmoreland, will have to compromise and do his best clean up the mess left behind by the Lord Rock's Commissariat. But the corruption from Houdin's regime runs deep, and if America is to capitalize on the East, East Asian or East African puppet, much work will have to be done, of course. Admin efficiency to improve, more political power, much need to change, uh, begin to improve, passively improve a troubled land. Um, miscellaneous costs, but you get more growth and more political power. And we are definitely going to need more political power, triple lamp. But for the process, uh, a pro uh, transitioning to a fully civilian government can truly begin. One issue must be addressed the warlords. During the days of Hutu's regime, warlords popped up too fast for even his brutal SS regiments to crack down on them. In addition, the national daddyist methods have always been had a way of radicalizing and riling up the people to support these warlords. With the support of small villages and entire swaths of countryside to hide him, they can wage an endless war against whatever powers they believe it has it out for them. The success of the offense African governments rests on the nice edge with this issue. For if it's handled, the entire house of cards might just come tumbling down, so we're already improving in poverty immediately. Um, ooh, deficit's not getting so good. 0.4 billion is not good. Uh, we're spending a lot on the civvy stuff, and we don't get enough money, but GDP is looking okay. We have a little bit of inflation, skyrocketing actually, and we have a little bit of debt, but otherwise not bad. And if you're wondering about OFN Interim Command, please go right ahead. We need to work on our uh, admin hold and political stability, and this stuff doesn't really matter for now. So increase local workforce, decrease, spend money, industrial expertise increases. I want to make sure we get more money, but I want to make sure we have enough political stability as well as admin hold, which is not very good at all right now. Um, we might want to do restore order in the countryside. Main roads is also okay, but I also want money. So decrease political stability, more admin hold, get more money in monthly income. A 50 million extra income is really going to help us out, so I think we're going to start with that one. Followed up with whatever can give us more stability and whatnot. I like to order store order the countryside, as well as pacify the main roads. We might pacify the main roads first, though, so let's wait. It is now June, but uh, yeah, getting some money would be very good. And political stability is going to be super important as well. So, um, a little bit more debt, but what else is new? How much need to change? Admin hold will increase. Uh, monthly income will increase as well. Attrition against rebellions. Organized bombing raids. Ooh. No matter how many men are fielded in the garrison across the jungles and savannas, there will never be enough to fully secure all the territory of East Africa. There are just too many places to hide, too many unmarked paths to travel, and too much terrain to cover. But warlords often raid villages around their headquarters for supplies, making it rather easy to find their hiding holes in the jungle. While they often lack the troops to take these bases out in a ground assault, they can still be weakened or destroyed through superior firepower. By organizing bombing raids on known warlord strongholds, we can deal with a serious blow to their ability to collect supplies and fight effectively, without putting any of our precious manpower at risk. Bombings won't be enough to bury the warlords on their own, but there'll be another nail in the coffin. Five research slots? Very nice. 1966. I'm not super concerned about technology, really, so. We got a little bit of here. Start paying off the debt just a little bit. 0.4 is not bad. Uh, growth is going to be a little bit stagnant, but deficit? We can kind of deal with that deficit. That deficit's not too bad. But with this, uh, we're going to pass by the main roads, increase stability because it's looking not very good, and help us out here overall, which would be very, very nice as well. Oh, and happy July, everybody. Power is getting better. We're basically a gloriously prosperous nation. Legacy of the Os Africana Show Research, not bad. We have East African Warlordism, which is pretty bad. And then we also have lackluster infrastructure, which is not good either. So, a troubled land. Fire and die salam! In front of my rage for days! <clears throat> before, for a day, I guess I should really say. Uh, uh, before Lieutenant John Lincoln's garrison managed to quench it. The warehouse itself had been utterly decimated, and the supplies contained within even more so. It had not been a great loss or anything, the warehouse had been one that only contained clothing, and John figured he could order the men to reuse their own sweaty clothes until more arrived. It would not be a, too great a bother. The fire did not seem natural, though. Nothing this close to the docks could have caused it unless there had been a thunderstorm John had completely missed. The question remained, had it been neglect negligence by some lazy worker, or had been sabotaged? As he tried to puzzle it out, John began to pace up and down the pier, as he carefully dodged into those spots marked by the char. char. He turned back towards the warehouse until out of the corner of his eye spotted something shivering beneath the waves. John crouched down, somewhat precariously leaning over the edge of the pier to get a better look. He squinted, trying to make out the shape through the black depths. As the murkiness cleared, a sudden realization struck him. Someone had dropped a gasoline barrel down there. Oh boy, oh crap. 
Um, quickly he turned and began to shout towards his ideal patrol. Woods, Johnson, help him get out of this out of the water. A sense of dread slowly began to seep into the American officer as his men rushed over. It's no accident. Oh, and we get fires of revolution. Oh, shh, Nikes. Finishing the job. I guess we'll probably do this one next as well. The fight against the warlords up until now, and at this point, has been relatively small scale and tame. Since the fall of the Houthi regime, there have been an uneasy lull in the fighting, as the warlords reevaluate the positions and tactics regarding the new OFN forces and the OFN for reinforced their positions and capabilities across the vast territories of East Africa. Now, however, the OFN is ready to bring down the new nuance, uh, nuisance of the warlords. We have enough men, enough materials and supplies, and we have enough will finally to bring or begin to crush this problem before it gets any worse. American troops and local militias will begin the long, arduous fight of pushing the warlords back rather than just slowing them down. With American brawn and African blood, our list of enemies stands to get much shorter. Good God, this is nothing good. Um, it goes up and it goes down. It's slowly going up. Deficit's getting looking worse. Extremely high deficit sucks. <sighs> Not good. Yeah. Because right now, all we get is like 0.69, which is better than what we had earlier. It was like 0.29, I think, earlier, but it's definitely better than where we had it, so. Can't complain too much, and playing as often mandates. I don't have a lot of experience playing as them. Uh, I played at the time of this recording as Angola, which was a lot of fun, but we'll see. It's a little out of time. Special Forces stuff's a little out of time. All this stuff's already done because I took care of all, all this stuff when I played as RFK to get here, basically, so. Um, that's not good, but whatever. It was up, down, it'll shoot all the way up. That's not good. Organize them bombing raids and finish a job, god dang it. More political power, stability, growth. Miscellaneous cost goes down as well. It's not good. 22% is not good. Work with the cooperatives. Push out the settlers. Uh, to end the constant struggle. That would be nice. I would like that one. We've got to finish a job and work with the cooperative revolutionaries. And I would like more money too. Ah, oh, man. We could go through here and just rush for this one um, as much as possible. So, Italy joins OFM. Attrition against rebellions. The rebel warlord problem is not one that will simply evaporate overnight with the announcement of new protections, or be destroyed in a single offensive. It remains an issue for at least a few years at best. Thus, it becomes necessary to adopt a more long-term strategies in dealing with it. For this task, West Merlin and his staff favor the old strategy of pure, unadulterated attrition. Hit the warlords fast, frequently wear herbs, bombing runs on supply depots, securing resources, of food and water, and annihilating any military target that dares to expose themselves. In a few months, when most of the warlords are starving, perhaps will consider their life choices and make sure the few they have left are more than thought than more thought through. The freedom military choice, uh, the freedom military force claims Tanjanika. Finishing the job, that'll be nice to do as well. And we'll probably go through here, and I want to get this one as fast as possible, and then we'll probably go down to center path. Let's get this one. Well, many of the revolutionaries in the world, the Palut, the African jungle, have been driven to such insane and extreme that they will refuse to compromise about anyone. Many more possess a more sensible disposition. These groups, mainly consisting of revolutionary socialists, have expressed interest in peace, cooperation, and compromise with the open interim government, and as there is no good reason not to. Most well, Merlin officials from the government will meet with these am am amiable groups to ensure or pursue potential alliances. And brought to the side of the interim government, in the fight against the remaining warlords, they could provide approved and valuable military assets. That'd be good. Gosh. Um, up here. Sure, we'll get that one too. Why not? That's, that's a little more manageable. Not bad, not bad. What else can we do here? 50. Work on political stability as much as we can. Admin hold is not good. If there's anything we can do for both, yeah, pass by the main roads. That'd be probably for the best. Decrease. The experience will go up too, which is nice, but whatever. Work with cooperative revolutionaries. Peace conference is over. Ah, the Germans are doing it, and it's almost October. Work with the cooperative revolutionaries. Yes, if we have to, you know. Degemonization, the camps. A mismanaged territory? One of the great things about the Houthi regime was that it was very efficient. Armies and resource extraction were very clearly sorted, filed, or filled, and concentration camps and other major bases were marked clearly in maps and had access to electricity and other amenities. And every last bureaucratic detail had been neatly organized for the American occupation to find, unfortunately. This admin beauty ran only skin deep, that is to say, it only applied official outposts and property of the Reich's Commissariat. Deep in the jungles of Mozambique and Tanz Tanzania, on the plains of Zambia, or the. Uh, oh, look at that. Nice. Uh, or the Kenyan savannah. The one would be hard-pressed to find any evidence that Hutik and his butchers had ever been here at all. The truth of the matter is that the German administration had very little control, true control over the territory. When new labor camp or mine needed to be built, it would be, while the rest of the Dark Continent went unexplored unexploited. In reality, there was very few bases and mines inland. Almost all the Reich's Commissariat's infrastructure was a few miles within and from the coast. America is a capitalist on this military government. The riches of East Africa must be found used and without slavery this time. Ah. Uh. 
We're not quite there yet. We're getting closer, though. The Freedom Military Force claims Tanjaniko. We, the loyal sons of Africa, have remained too long, too quiet, as the Americans have colonized and too frequently bastardized the strong and formidable countries and count counties of the African nation in Tanjaniko. The Freedom Military Force does lay claim to those rightful places and provinces of the African nation and in perpetuity. We'll hold these lands and claims in the name of liberty and the long created emancipation long denied to the freeborn peoples. We hereby denounce the American occupiers as friends of the Dutchmen, working in, in an attempt to suppress the spirit and heritage of the African nation. These falsely determined mandates are but the Dutchman colonies under a new name in an attempt to deceive and dominate the greater peoples of Africa, which are in all things strong and blessed. And casting out the stricken chains that have been bound upon us without justice, we warn the Americans to withdraw and leave in perpetuity. A government blessed by God and the peoples of the African nation, in the face of tyranny, we will launch glorious revolution to achieve rule by just leadership, and with the ideals of great hum humility at our nation's forced front. If this does not occur, the fires of liberation will burn that of those who would envy us the righteousness and freedom that come to those who are born with liberty and the means of the will of all peoples. Those who deny us this right are thus declared fascist oppressors, meaning that they deny the rule of God over his people and the legitimacy of democratic governance. I, huh? Mm, yeah, pass by main roads would be best. More dead, but whatever. 8.8 is .8 not, not too bad every single day. What you need to change, mismanage territory, control the chemical industries. What if the income will increase? I like that too. Five million. We'll probably go with control the chemical industries first. Let's do this one too. Guys, we're at forty-one percent, which is not good. <clears throat> so we'll do this. We'll do that. We'll do that. But we all want to end the constant struggles as well. The force of rebels, renegades, and warlords are like a hydra against one which can never win. By the time one head has been cut off, one group crushed has been replaced by something more numerous and more radical. If the efforts of the interim government are in establishing pro offend governments are to be successful, it needs to act proactively in the fighting anti-American groups. Local and regional powers of dubious loyalty will be investigated and policed by American forces. At the first signs of disloyalty, they'll be disbanded or destroyed. The message must be clear. Embrace democracy or you will be eradicated. Nice. Destroy the camps. We definitely need political stability as well, so we might also do... Destroy the camps. While the assets run labor and death camps of the Houthi regime were shut down, the moment the OFM forces gained control of them, almost all of them still remain in working order, waiting silently in the jungles of East Africa. Many local populations have been asked for the camps to be fully destroyed, not only to ensure that they never reopen, but to also remove a dark memory that continues to pollute the land. Recognizing the opportunity for good publicity, West Merlin and his staff decided to quite literally blow up the remaining labor camps on live TV. Not only would it be a spectacular show of OFM might, it would improve the image of the OFM government at both home and abroad. We would lose five political power if we got rid of this one immediately. So let's do this one first. Fights in Zanzibar and Tanjanika. Oh, crap. General D. Paul D. Harkins had been amongst those who had been uh, laughed at when he said victory was well and sudden in South Africa. They had laughed, mocked, and even sung songs about it. Well, at time proven General Harkins are right indeed. Now Africa was being brought into democracy. Even had to be done with a bit of violence at times, General Harkins was darn sure that one day it would all be proving worthwhile in Africa. But now, thanks to the actions of a group of rebel insurgents, some began to doubt once again the great struggles of, of American of democracy. Uh, the thought almost caused Harkins to laugh out loud, although the human remains don't face. Only a yellow son of a gun would think the U.S. Army could be beaten back by some natives calling themselves a freedom military force, even if they had to begin to make the very worst of gains of the past few months. When they began to seize control of land for the army's Zanzibar, attacking Harkins' patrols in the process, these belly acres got even louder, exclaiming that the efforts in Africa was doomed. They could not see what Harkins saw an opportunity. While the rebels and enemies ride in the open, the general knew that in firm effort, they could smash through them, defeating the enemies of the United States once and for all. He sent telegram after telegram to Westmoreland, asking him to send the troops necessary to finish the FMF once and for all. Hooray, vic hurry, victory in Africa is right around the corner. Crackdown, Tanjanika. After years of constant crushing defeats, bound and humiliations, a few remaining African warlords are growing increasingly desperate. This is brought to nearly everyone in the interim government. They have largely set aside their differences and banded together under a few of the most powerful warlords. Now they have set their sights on Tanjanika, one of the most populous and important provinces in the entire region. With much more concentrated and organized forces, the warlords are causing absolute mayhem. The American garrisons aren't strong enough to mount an effective defense of every remote town. And the native militias and solicitors' allies are either deserting, excuse me, deserting or retreating in the face of this onslaught. General Westmoreland knows that the situation is allowed to continue. It could spiral out of control, possibly leading to the complete destruction of the OFM presence here. With overwhelming force and a moratorium on mercy, American troops will organize themselves and utterly annihilate these last remnants of the warlords. And when they're done, the whole continent will know that what it means to threaten American might. Fix the situation in restore stability. If ignored for too long, it might spiral out of control. So I decided, you know what, let's rush towards this. Um, if you want to do this again, please go right ahead. I've mismanaged territory. So we're going to prove ourselves here too, because we will need that political power. So, Marshall's Revolution kind of sucks. Not going to lie, it, it really sucks actually a lot. And eh, peace conference over. Is it Indonesia or something like that? Maybe Russia. I don't think it's Indonesia though. Quite a bit of lag, but whatever. And, oh, nope, it's Muscovy. Of course. Destroy the camps. If you want to do this again, please go right ahead. A good look at hack. You know. Nope. 
and Muscovine is probably getting released. Um, so it's making the game lag extremely hard, which I always hate, so. Always hate. Control the chemical industries. Yes, please. While he and his cohorts failed to exploit Africa's internal resources, Udi was new to in setting up industry where it was needed. Dozens of large industrial scale chemical production centers or facilities were constructed on the coast during the German occupation, ostensibly to produce war, uh, water purification tablets, pesticides, and malaria medication. There is, of course, no way to verify this claim, as most of the actual production lines were destroyed. Regardless of what these chemical plants were used for originally, there's still quite a lot of machinery intact. By inviting in American per, uh, chemical corporations like the Dow Chemical and DuPont, we're going to raise American investments as well as stimulate the economy. The battle, uh, battle for Dar es Salaam. Ooh! The victory had been absolute. General, General William R. Pierce could see that sim by simply observing the grounds in which it had been fought. More than a single warehouse had been burned to the ground that night. Bodies were strewn all throughout the streets of Dar es Salaam and several children. Pierce had a weak stomach for a soldier, and in that moment it almost gave. He held it together, though. Someone had to. Pierce did not know what it had been done had it been done by the Freedom Military Force, and what had been done by the U.S. military. The orders were only to fire the FMF man, but to the green boys who made up his regiment. Every black man with a rifle was in an insurgent, what Pierce knew, knew for certain was that only one side would be celebrating this massacre, and only one side survived to take the blame. There would be consequences for this ripple effects throughout the mandate. If there were still natives who believed the U.S. was looking out for the Africans first and foremost, Pierce darn well hoped that they didn't hear about this. Before there had been skirmishes and rebellions, the military force may have well have started another war, finding himself in a quiet corner of the city. Oh, far away. From any celebrations of funerals, Piers lit up a cigar, hoped it would be work it all out, and yet feared it would not. Okay, so... Yeah, that's not bad, but not great, so... We'll control the chemical factories and destroy the camps soon. Crack down on the, on the Natchers. But right now, we're actually looking okay for yearly surplus. We've not done anything different now, but we actually have a small yearly surplus, which is pretty good. Thank God for the re uh, excess revenue, of course. Um, so... And that's looking not too bad either. Mismanaged territory, the Tame Revolution. We currently get 0.87 political power now. Not great. Could be better. But we're approaching a new month, and I hope you enjoy the month of April. You know, we get we still need more political power. I mean, it sucks. It really sucks. And we went down by th 0.3 million dollars. The GDP, the debt went down by 3 million dollars, which is, you know, it's not great. Uh, political stability is looking okay. Admin hold is looking a little better. So, Eastern African developments. Why are we not even looking at Africa? Africa's over here. Um, yeah, nothing really we can do about that. Peace conference is over. We do have a cup of coffee here to keep some nice and warm as well. So, let's do this again to get some more money. Uh, uh, Status report 1967 of East Africa. The situation in East Africa is uh, multifaceted and complex, but in some way there are two regions of the country. The first is the coastal region, which was well developed by the Germans and serves as a convenient port of of call for our vessels and can be held against attacks from the interior. That's where the majority of East Africa's industry is located. Well secured against attacks and sabotages, we can use the same defenses to keep it secured for the U.S. The other region of note is the interior. A wilderness of jungle, where very little change in our occupation is occupied primarily by rebels who originally sought to avoid the depredations of the Nazis but do not seem interested in cooperating with the U.S. government either. The situation in the interior will likely continue to cause problems throughout the course of our mission. As for the available resources, the primary one of note is the chemical industry that Hutu was building up before his overthrow and disappearance. It's currently geared to the production of chemical weapons, which could be retold and retasked to the benefit of the OFN investors from the chemical industry, or to be used to bolster the military capabilities of the OFM. In conclusion, while the occupation is likely to be short, we can provide significant boons to American business while we figure out a way to bring relative stability to the region. Let's get to work! Promote OFN investments. Ooh. A monthly income will increase, more research speed and output. I wish we get more political power some way. The Eastern Arms Company. Make room for our generals. Correct on the traders. The Germanization. Well, I do want to do this one. We read this one earlier, so promote OFN investments, maybe? At the moment, the interim government simply does not have the resources. The map are developed a vast wild territory. There's little to, to no infrastructure, too little capital, and too little time. And this East African venture is not only to be a successful government, but also a successful economic venture for the U.S. This problem must be rectified. So General Westmoreland and his senior military staff devise a plan. About American no and corporations to invest in and develop the East Africa of their own. Similar to how the American West was tamed by corporations and the growing desire for more land resources. So too might East Africa be tamed by corporations from all around the OFM by doing this. We not only develop the land, but also create a steady, reliable source of income for both the interim government and, of course, the United States. Still not bad. 26% percent is not very good. Decrease expertise. Replace difficult leaders. I'd like to do that, but whatever. Increase money exploitation. Uh, increase the good reserves. Get extra money every month. Oh, uh, for now, go and do that one. I want money every month. I really want the money every month. So that we can start working on this stuff. Do the deficit's okay. Not really concerned about that. Um... 
0.86. We could use more stability, so we'll do all that. Invite Dow Chemical. Get more research speed for our factory alpha. Monthly income increases by $10 million, which is not very much in all honesty, but I think we'll destroy the camps next. I think that'd be good to do. So that'd be good to do. Destroy the camps and uh, track down that they're Nazis. So. Deep in the jungles of East Africa, according to General Westmoreland, as well as several intelligence analysis agencies, lie the scattered depleted remnants of the old Nazi regime. According to many often contradictory witness statements, these old SS officers are low on almost every source but street brutality. Many villages in more isolated territories report attacks from well armed white men still flying the colors of Hutex Rex Commissary out. If these reports and rumors are true, then these remnants are a clear uh, represent a clear and imminent danger to the stability and security of the OFN interim government. For if they can continue operations, they'll drastically lower the confidence of the native population in the OFN's military capabilities. In light of such dangers, Westmoreland and the general staff plan to launch a massive, heavily publicized campaign to find the remaining SS units hiding in the jungle and destroy them. A good look at heck. What is this place anyway? Any idea, Chuck? Two American soldiers, closely followed by the rest of their squad, made their way into the facility before them, which had a strangely ominous appearance with its high towers and sharp wire fences. Something in the back of the PFC. Charles Bird's mind wanted to run away, just throw everything away and run for the place, but ignored it. Just a bunch of creepy buildings, noting nothing more. They said something about it being a concentration camp that we had to check it out to make sure it was safe to dismantle. I don't know what that means, but if I'm being honest, Bill, it doesn't sound too friendly. Charles jerked his head in one direction, trying to get Private William Jones ahead that way. Let's try to wrap up this quickly so we can get the heck out of here. Barely a minute had passed before a yelp rang out, and Charles rolled his eyes. Private William probably got spooked by his own shadow or something like that. As he marched over to William, he noticed the private was struck with a genuine terror while looking at the open door before him. Bill, what in the gosh darn meaning of this? Charles asked, his tone half furious and half concerned. Backing away from the door slowly, William pointed a shaking finger towards it, its words coming out like a ravings of a madman. Chuck, there, oh god, oh god, please, please help them. Pushing William aside, Charles looked into the dark building for himself. Greeting him was the sight of an indeterminable number of people, who looked like the essence of death to the last. They were Africans, but every single one of them looked so frail, so starved that they might shatter in the wind. Charles felt the horror of it all creeping into every inch of his body. Behind him, he heard William puking up his guts, and he could only quietly whisper the next words, God help them all. Look deeply into life, and you'll always find a despair. The main trial is invite Dow Chemical. The Dow Chemical Company is one of the largest in the world, and certainly in the U.S. While we might have very few individuals with the skills and knowledge to properly utilize and retool abandoned Nazi chemical plants, they certainly do. By inviting them back uh, to take over the plants and get them back in working order, we can get a massive boost in private investment funds. With them here, a large American corporation will have a vested interest in seeing the unity government succeed. Ah, we need more political stability, which is looking not too bad. I want to increase our admin hold as well, even though I do want to get more money. Increasing your GDP would be very nice too. Actually, fifteen million dollars a month would be bad. Chilean government collapses. Um, I did earlier did one of these, but we'll probably restore order of the countryside, massively increase political stability, and I'm in whole increase a little bit too. Track down the nasty though. So. That'd be good. Yes, please. That'd be nice, 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 nice. Look at the manpower we have. Over two hundred thousand. It's not bad. Three ninety six. Not bad for debt. Not bad. Not bad. Degeminization, huh? Military factory overseas. Um, uh, but more money. Admin efficiency. Where are we at for admin efficiency? Well, it's slowly getting better. There's a lot of lag right now too for some reason. Um, ah, French Civil War. Eh? French Civil War. Siphon German research. Cooperate with the Anglo's, huh? Cooperate with the socialists. Well, let's do military overseeing factories. The peace that the U.S. military maintains with East Africa and the African mandates as a whole is a tenuous at best. Smaller towns and villages find themselves often hosts of bandits to local warlords. These groups take what they want and move on, leaving destruction in their wake. As such, isolated industrial complexes that handle volatile materials and thus must be away from civilization make ideal targets. Chemical plants and other such important industries that have seen many factories raided or destroyed by roving bands of marauders. And while this problem persists, it will be much harder to convince American corporations to invest here. Thus, it becomes necessary to protect these factories as if they were military outposts. Every factory shall have at least a platoon of American soldiers to oversee and protect it from the outside harm, such that a raid or worse, take takeover is rendered almost impossible. More money, monthly income will increase by five billion, and industrial expertise will slowly begin to increase as we sip on a little bit of our coffee here. All right, so it went down by three million. Not bad, you know. Meeting with big chemicals. Outside of meeting room in Quillamane. Westmoreland tapped his foot impatiently. Looking once again at his watch, it was a few minutes past time for the discussion to start. What was taking him so long? At last, the door opened and Pierce walked out, giving him a salute. They're ready for you all, sir. 
It took him long enough to put some on the ground body as he fall appears in the room and let the door shut behind him. But they were gathered representatives of Dow Chemical. These men were of a noble uh, economic influence and importance, all uh, seated at a long table facing him. Westmoreland was not one to be easily intimidated, however. Welcome, gentlemen, to East Africa. I'm sure you're all why I ask you here to meet with me, because there's really only one good reason. I'm offered to make the chemical industry of East Africa available for the use of Dow Chemical. A few members came from the representatives, but most regarded this with a quiet interest. General Westmoreland, if I may. One of the masks, as Westmoreland's nod, the man continued. How much do you expect us to charge us for the use of this industry? Surely you aren't doing this out of the kindness of your heart. I got a smile from Westmoreland. That's my favorite part. We aren't necessarily charging you any money. There's no real investment necessary on your part. I have to pause it for a moment to Westmoreland and continue. But full cooperation with the OFN is expected, so if we need your help with anything, you better be prepared to do so or we're both in trouble. Suffering turned to profit. And the East Arms Company? Sure, why not? Well, industrial subsidiaries uh, and corporations are being still set up. It may be profitable to set up an industrial interest of our own. Well, so much of the chemical industry going to Dow Chemical, the weapon and private arms sector lies relatively clear of private interests. Thus, we can create the Eastern Arms Company, a new corporation that would produce weapons and supplies for soldiers, not just in East, East Africa, but across the OFM. We could easily invite some savvy American business magnates and entrepreneurs to chair the board, and we already have the factories to produce this equipment, so the operation should be relatively low risk, with the potential for high reward. I'm all about that money. We're Americans here. We gotta make more money. Uh, I did this one, I think, earlier. So it was really good for us, but I want to do this one. Greatly increase political stability for now. Uh, increase a tiny bit. Uh, go ahead and do that one. Why not? I just we gotta make sure our admin holds even better, though. Because it's too low. So from here out, we'll probably focus more on admin holds as much as possible. It's still not looking bad, though. 10%. 5%. 5.5% growth. Pretty decent, I'd say. And then we'll do degermanization next. Well, Rock's Commissar Han Tutek's regime toiled for more than two decades to Germanize much of the African continent with German settlers and cultural influence. His efforts clearly failed. Lack of interest in Africa, the collapse of the Reich's economy, more ample and fertile land to be found in Europe, left little reason to invest into East Africa, but many traces of German rule can still be found lurking in each and every corner of the old colony. Road signs and rail line markers are written almost exclusively in German. Many thousands of white Nazi settlers live in cities and towns dotting the coast. And some old German infrastructure still remains intact in order to erase the red traces of the Nazi taint. The signs will be rewritten, rewritten in both their local language and English. The German infrastructure base will be torn down or repurposed. And the Nazi settlers will be investigated in their place. American companies and industrial conglomerates will be invited in once more to fill the economic hole left by the tumor of Nazism and push out the settlers. With almost all the few thousand German settlers located, apprehended, and investigated, there's no time to decide exactly what to do with them. While most of them are low ranking officials and their families, so, uh, they still participated in and allowed vicious crimes against humanity to go on. In addition, the continued presence in East Africa has drawn much iron and caused quite a bit of friction with the natives. This, thus, as they are partially criminal and detrimental to the stability of the interim government, General Westmoreland and the military staff elected to deport the Germans. Within a few months, they'll all be on the boat back to their homeland and out of the government's hair. Well, which would be a nice thing, too. More money! Uh, push out the settlers, hire native militias. More stability would be, would be nice. Train local native militias. Um, train ourselves an army of East Africa's future, giving them a head start in stabilizing newly found government in the land rebels and whatnot. Slap in German research. The Hutu regime was brutal and had no regard for human life or well being, but they also wrought the cutting edge of technology in many areas, many chemical. Well, a lot of this research and knowledge went back to Germany, the flow of information stopped when Hitler did. The Commissariat of East Africa had some of the most advanced chemical tech on Earth before it and its technology fell into the hands of the OFM. By digging through all the research they collected over the years, the OFM could gain very valuable resources or insights into German combat and medical capabilities, as well as gaining edge on them in terms of chemical weaponry. While some may find even the discussion of such weapons barbaric, any war with Germany would be little more than an exercise in barbarity to begin with. Admin hole increases a little bit. We'll increase. Political stability will decrease. We get more money, increase GDP. Um, I do want to do this one though. I just want more admin hold though. Oh, I'll do this one first. Why not? Screw it. Higher native militias. Extracting the lots of German influence and the warlords will be no cost, and it'll be a toll paid in blood in the current East African situation. That means American blood. Blood will no doubt draw ire from back home to avoid this problem. Uh, somewhat, General Westmoreland has proposed a plan, hiring native East African tribesmen and recruiting them into ragtag militia groups to fight the remaining Nazis and warlords. These natives bear no great love for either of the latter groups, as they have been responsible for the destruction and poverty now seen across much of the countryside. While these native militias will be somewhat poorly trained, equipped, and disciplined, they could also open up a massive manpower pool that will be necessary in restoring law and order to a region utterly bereft of either. Can cooperate with the Anglos. 
Ludwig may have been a power-hungry, slaving, egomaniacal dictator, but he was far from a fool. By cooperating with permanent Anglophone settlements in Rhodesia, he was able to increase his manpower pool as well as reduce the amount of territory he had to garrison. By doing the same, the OFA interim government could achieve something similar, of course. Given their prior cooperation with the Hutu regime, the move will be controversial, so Westmoreland will arrange suitable punishment for their harshest of collaborators. The only tang tangential complicit with Nazi crimes, however, will be free to go. They will be the linchpin of future Rhodesian compliance, will not soon forget the favors done for them by the OFN and the Kulamane trials. Or secure the East African government. While well, it seems to get lost in the protocol and powers associated with the military rule, we must remind ourselves that a military government is supposed to be a temporary affair. The longer the people of East Africa see American troops enforcing a law, collecting taxes, and harvesting resources, the more discontent will grow and the more the people will see the mandates by as no better than the Reichs Commissariats. By allowing much more regional autonomy and giving the people a method of letting their voices and concerns be heard, the stability and longevity of the interim government can be greatly improved. Look into the VX. The best weapon is the one never needed, and so it goes with the chemical weapons. While the chlorinated hordes of the Great War seem a distant faded memory, there are still the men who survived those horrors. We may claim to be above the use of such weaponry, but the fear of those use by the Germans or more likely the Japanese drives the American government to express interest in their development. As such, the nerve agent VX, discovered by the regime, has come to General Westmoreland's attention. It's extremely fast-acting and far more potent than similar chemicals like sarin, taking less than 10 milligrams to kill a man. It first came to the attention of American spies operating in England during the 50s, and now, more than a decade later, we can not only develop countermeasures for it, but we can manufacture the best interests of everyone. At long last, the government of four East Africans by East Africans was being designed in order to turn the occupation to a transitional government that was meant to be. More Africans would be brought into the administration and involved in the plans for the new government, and therefore the mandate would be made more legitimate, hopefully reducing the level of unrest. Of course, that didn't mean Westmoreland was giving up actual control. The military regime would be transferred into this transitional administration to keep the peace and further develop the plans of the OFN for East Africa. It would be a temporary measure, of course. The mandate won't last forever, after all. However, as Westmoreland went over this version of the plans for the new government, he thought that, for now, only the military could be trusted to prevent conflict. At least progress is being made in the Kulamane trials. While all major remaining SS officers have been apprehended and lay rotting in jail, the calls for the deportation, execution, or the penal measure to be inflicted upon them now grow ever louder. The calls especially loud amongst the Africans, who after years of desolation at the hands of these men, wish to see them get their just dues. And to improve relations with the native Africans, as well as the peace of the doves back home, Westmoreland has decided not to sit upon the drumhead and not write sentence the remaining war criminals to death. Rather, the Nazis of the East African regime will be put on trial for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other charges. This will give the interim government a very good PR back home as well as please the native Africans and make room for their, our generals. Now that the house of the East African bureaucratic and industrial system has been truly cleansed out of its Nazi influence, it remains unexpectedly empty. As much as the Germans of the regime were brutal war criminals, they were unusually efficient in organizing and running the vast, desperate territories of East Africa. Now that these low-level bureaucrats and administrators have been imprisoned, executed, or deported, there are now many holes in administrative goings-on of the interim government. To remedy the issue, non-essential OFN officers of rank, a captain, or higher will be officially signed uh, admin duties for the betterment of the interim government. Uh, this will provide a temporary but tenable solution. And once we get the Quillamane trials, we get 0.88 political power every day. Ah, uh, the deaths are looking great, but GDP is not looking bad either. I know budget is negative 137 million, but whatever. The Quillamane trials, gentlemen of the jury, we are gathered here today for the trial of Franz Hussler. Hussler. And, oh, crap, guess, oh, that's not good. Chaos is here at the Kingdom Make Connect. And for those of the Street Stuff Associates, here today with them as well. Oh, look at this, guys. Well, they failed. Savimbi is here. Well, that sucks for y'all. Um, it's the beginning of the Quillaman trial, which in which numerous captured SS officers would be the tried by a jury consistent. Consisting entirely of reliable junior American military officers, so there was little doubt in the minds of anyone in the rooms of how the trial would play out. Presiding over the court was the U.S. Army General William R. Pierce, who had ensured the trials would be held in total secrecy as to prevent a diplomatic crisis with the Reich. Turning to the queues, he continued, Mr. Hersler, please rise to hear those charges. Well, he did so. And the clerk began reading off his crimes, Mr. Hersler. You are charged with throughout the course of the South African conflict. You committed war crimes and crimes against the African people. Looking directly at Hersler himself, the clerk said, the next part slowly, How do you plead? Rather than fear or regret or anything of the sort, the only emotion that SS Obersturm von Führer, Franz Hersler, showed was delight. Guilty, not guilty. What does it matter to you in the court of yours? He replied, and amused grin across his face. Since you asked, though, I am guilty. I have overseen the extermination of countless mongrels and subhumans, and were I a free man, I would gladly see that of countless more. Yes, I am guilty, and I could not be more proud of it, you filthy dog. As General Pierce only shook his head in response, military police restrained Hersler for his remarks. So be it. Hersler, you are hereby sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for your crimes. May God grant you mercy one day, because you'll never find it again on earth. As the MPs dragged Hersler out in the courtroom, he looked up at Pierce with utter contempt. Without sparing him a single glance, Pierce turned to the clerk of the court, who is next? Justice at last, and trained local uh, native divisions. The new native militias, were, while already proving their worth in protecting the numerous and desperate regions of East Africa, aren't exactly a fighting force to be reckoned with. 
They can hold their own against a small scale raid or two, but as soon as the warlord takes notice of them and the positions, they may as well be throwing rocks for all the good it'll do them. They're deeply motivated and eager to fight, and they just aren't good at that. To remedy this problem, West Merlin and the general staff will begin training regiments for these newly created units of militia. At the moment, they may be disorganized, undisciplined, and under supplies, with a bit of assistance from American drill sergeants, but they might just be whipped into a fighting force capable of pushing back the warlords. The Quillamane Trials Part 2. With the trials concluded and the accused convicted to a man, General what, G William R. Peters now sat at his desk with a summary of the proceedings, looking over it. He felt fairly satisfied with the result. Most like Hustler, I've been proud of the genocidal work. Monsters without even the pretense of a regret. Others had at least seemed to be apologetic, but that's the way they were faking it. Peters could never tell, of course. Either way, they needed to pay to the fullest for what they had done, and from now on they would spend the rest of their days in secret prison cells to force to give the U.S. information about the U.S.S. less lessen their suffering the slightest. It's the least they deserved. Nevertheless, the thought of that the public might learn about the trials and thereby the Reich worried Peters. He had prohibited uh, civilians from attending and sworn all officers present to secrecy, yet doubt still plagued his mind. There might be much intelligence to be gained and propaganda to be made from this, but he had to wonder if it outweighed the potential diplomatic crisis that might come about if the resources or sources were ever discovered. There was no such thing as a winning nuclear war. Putting in the summary inside of a box labeled top secret, he swiftly closed the lock and locked it to a prying eyes. It's all said, come on in, he commanded. And the door to his office swung open to reveal a young officer who served as his aide, quickly giving him a crisp salute. I want you to take this directly to the Pentagon. There's a flight ready for you. Take it no matter what. Don't take your eyes off this box. If you lose it or open it, there will be severe consequences for you. Am I clear? That the young man's yes. Uh, sir. Pierce handed the locked box over to him and watched as he carried off into the distance, out of sight. Then he leaned back into his chair and sighed. There's no easy cure for those concerns, but now it's out of his hands and he had done what he could to serve his country and all of humanity. If nothing else, he could be proud of that. That thing to do is easy. Well, sometimes. Local expertise. Miscellaneous income. 0.112. 441 billion in debt. But it's still the same now. Having all the increases. Let's go with that one. Make room for the generals. Train local militias. Cooperate with the Anglos. I read that one earlier too, so that's good as well. So if you're going to about to eliminate troublesome warlords, please go ahead. As much as liberal democracy is fun, I'm not sure they're ready for that. Cooperate with the socialists for popular revolutionary parties? I don't know about that either. We'll probably go with American-like leadership. At least African interim unity government is just that, interim. The military rule of the Western nations over one of the large swaths of territory on Earth isn't impractical. It's impossible. There simply aren't enough men down in every village and chuck every native for every weapon. Now, however, with the government's rule firmly established, West Merlin and the general staff believe the time has come to begin the long process of transitioning to a civilian government. Uh... While several pra practical options present themselves, General Westmoreland believes that a Western-friendly liberal democracy would be the easiest and best option for all parties involved. With the help of the American diplomats, negotiators, and businesses, Liberty Torch seems set to brighten the dark continent. Hold the East African Summit. For almost a century now, East Africa has been held by white overlords who cared little for the plight of the native Africans beneath them. The land was used only for the resources and cheap labor it could provide. Now, however, with the world war problem basically handled, the time has finally come to begin Africa, giving Africa back to the Africans. The transition from a military government to a civilian one will not be simple or easy, but and will require a great deal of effort on the part of everyone involved. Uh, General Westmoreland will call hundreds of leaders from American-friendly regions and movements, as well as dozens of high-ranking officers to Quillamane. There they will discuss the terms of decolonization, demilitarization, and with it, the future of... East Africa, as Cameroon has just exploded. So, uh, sucks to be them. Free France is gone too, but still. Overall, not bad. Maxim Sars Muscovine, Provisional Commissary of the Western Russia, West Siberian People's Republic, Central Siberian Republic, Far Eastern Soviet Socialist Republic. A lot of socialism here. Paternalism, despotism, fascism. Hey, is fascist and national socialist Peters and Lucas related? Probably. Communism, socialism, you know. But we're, hey, only 97% of our population is poor. So I think we're doing well. You know, only 97% of the population is poor. Either Angola kind of failed. Uh, let's, let's host the summit. We'll see what happens. It's unfortunately 35 days. It takes forever to get through, but surplus is not bad. Um, it's really not bad at all. 10% debt GDP, 4.6% growth uh, is also very good. So overall, I'm feeling pretty pleased about this campaign. Now, we could have invested more for more growth here, but honestly, it doesn't matter as long as we keep doing this. Political stability keeps increasing. Our admin hold is unchallenged. Overall, not bad. Um, I do want to, well, I will, at the time of this recording, eventually play as OFM Provisional Government of the Congo. And I'll play as the big ass uh, Central African Republic, or whatever they call it. One that combines all three OFM mandates into one big old boy. So we'll get there eventually. But and I look forward to it as well. Increase by 0.05. Increase our liquid reserves. It's not that much billions, but. Increase our GDP by 1%, 4.041, and get $15 million in extra cash. God, I wish I could say that for real life. That'd be so great.
Oh, hey, good job, RFK. Good job for securing a second turn. But we'll see what the summit's like. Hopefully it goes okay. Crisis in Nanjing. Blacklister infrastructure, unfortunately, still. We're literally just building up roads, man. I like in Africa, I have nice roads. But happy February, everybody. Alright, here we go. The Quillamane Conference. General Westmoreland insisted on furnishing the old complexes in Quillamane and stripped bare between the looting and the Hutex, delusions of security and starkness. Already the politicians from each continent's anti-German organizations were beginning to accuse each other of all sorts of crimes against their own cause. It could care less, one of them would lead to prove that they could relay America's role against Nazi imperialism forevermore. The steam general gave the cold speech, insisting that the meeting's cause would be focused solely on what he claimed to be the greatest issues affecting the mandate after liberation. The independence groups were all given short dossiers on the general's own goals for the conference and allowed to meet and strategize the best follow suit with his own master plan, were only so easy. No, these backwater tribes may kept up their petty squabbles with the ancestors or concerns of American agitation, could they not see the plan that they had for a free Africa? Even had to reconvene every delegate after a fistfight between two of them over some darn problem. The only thing that kept this kind of line was forced, whether it was British, Portuguese, German, or American. They're not ready in the slightest to be on their own, so much work was needed. Work, the general muttered, th murmured, that will be done tomorrow. As the sun sets over Quillamane, the shouts of independence echo in the night. Shouting, shouting, shouting. A Bartzeland proposition. Not like the other representatives, the king of Bartzeland. Maintain part of his traditional fashion as he petitioned William Westmoreland. He told the solemn story of the suffering wrought upon his forefathers done by the manipulative and cruel treaties left him, left him unspoken for over decades. Whether they were British, Belgian, German, no matter how many loads he lived in the land, they were discarded and ignored. Presenting a map to the assembly, he sought the German general's aid in building a new nation among the ashes of German Africa, free from the tyranny of other African groups and European overlords. The borders he presented would throw a wrench under many of the plans Westmoreland had drafted before, but he could sense the king spoke with little, no alter, ulterior motives. As the conference was discussed, dismissed again, dismissed again, and Westmoreland appeared back over his back to see the king continue his talk with the few who wanted to know more. He asked an aid for more knowledge in Baratzelan. If it was so important, why was such a powerful man left without anything? As the staff went on with what he knew of the territory, the puzzle became clear to William. The king had a strong claim, but Baratzelan interfered with the goals of an overwhelming number of parties and blocks. They gave the king's dominion back might look good for the press and set a precedent of true liberation, but every neighbor to the fledging state would look to pick it apart months after the Americans left. The old king spoke with passion, but he needed to stick with the oath and if he was not to see his dream fall apart. An independent Baratzelan would be the crown jewel of our efforts in Africa. Crushed it by the continent saved. I'll let him have it. Is this parts of land? Oh god, and conflicts. Mustafa shook hands with the American generals he was given a chair to sit down at. His invitation to the conference won Westmoreland insisted upon. Uganda had been a bloody thorn of the British, Germans, and now American occupiers. Those Americans had little knowledge of the varied rebel groups that they fought in the area, but they knew their leaders like the back of his hand. Mustafa liked to think of himself as a peacemaker between the ethnic groups and partisans of Uganda, as well as one of the few profiles willing to sit down with William Westmoreland. The general mostly talked, or asked him, for details on other two big names thrown around. Idi Iman Dada, Mustafa explained, was a tough man, both his strength and his weakness. Dada's men were cruel and yet would have no trouble running a free Uganda as a stable, ultimately brutish regime. Worst of all, he noted to the tent of Westmoreland, Idi Iman Amin had friends scattered in every Ugandan organization. He himself knew that there was at least one man who would be ready to kill him if he fell out of favor. Tito Okello seemed to be a better man for the Americans, but it would be a guarantee Idi Iman Amin would simply start a guerrilla war, spilling across a fledgling nation, perhaps even causing collapse. Both Westmoreland and assistant peers looked to each other. They were too unsure of what wished to be the safer choice for independent Uganda. Um, hmm. Kill okay, we fell out of favor. Cruel. Just give it to him? Uh, we don't want it to collapse. Independence Day. After weeks of consulting and revising the draft proposed by William Westmoreland, the delegates gathered in Quillamane publicly and delivered. Oh crap, that's not good. <laughs> uh, delivered the answer to the world. Oh Jesus Christ. The scars of German tyranny were fresh in the African memory, and the answer was no longer a simple change of uniform of the occupants, but a number of free and independent African states. It was the word Africa the papers focused on return to the original territories. Return to the territories. The newly designated governments began the arduous process of rewriting the constitutions, ending the internal conflicts, of promising safe withdrawal of American troops across the region. More supportive of all, the new regions agreed uh, to treaties of friendship, promising cooperation against any would-be colonizer of East Africa. Many people vote one destiny. Ah, uh, Angolan Civil War. Agostino Nieto versus Savimbi. Ah. Uh. Many people vote one destiny, my friends. As we are now exploding. Oh. Well, I guess we're going to observe then. So we gave him Zambia. Kenneth Kaunda, 
They're all an observer. They, they're very, Jesus Christ, socialists. And the East African Federations of here too, led by Oscar Cambona. There's a lot of socialism here. Why are so socialist? And progressive as well, so... I guess that's going to be it for us. I don't think there's anything else here for us, which is, you know, fun to play as the mandate of East Africa, but... If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. Civilian dictatorship, wow. Um, as we'll see what else we can do in another campaign. Thanks for watching, have a great, great, great African rest of your day.